we will put you into a battle situation and create all of the battle stimuli such that you forget that you are in simulation and you literally then are linked with forces with whom you may join in combat. Now that we're into uh, high technology, circuit boards, television, media, multimedia, virtual reality, these are the tools that we're going to use in pursuit of American military preeminence. Meet the warriors of tomorrow. Their strategic sense, rapid responses to continually changing threat environments, and their thirst for the kill, combined with their ease with computers, makes them ideally qualified to fight the wars of the future. Years of high-speed battle against imaginary opponents have conditioned them for real modern war, where the body heat of distant enemies is spotted in video screens and flesh is seared from bone by remote control. Why are you on the beach and I ain't right? You can see me. This is the United States Army's favorite video game, the reconstruction of the Battle of 73 Easting, a Gulf War clash that began when an American tank troop decimated an entire Iraqi armored brigade in 23 minutes with no American casualties. The Army was so pleased with the performance of its men and machines that it turned 73 Easting into a training tool. Shortly after the battle occurred, scientists from the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency photographed the desert floor and interviewed the combatants to determine the course of events down to the millisecond. Then they reconstructed the entire battle in the computer-enhanced world of virtual reality. Now, soldiers refight the Battle of 73 Easting over and over again in virtual space, a place that exists only on hard drives. Virtual reality may be new to the general public, but the Army has explored this terrain since the mid-1980s. It became increasingly evident to me that we were moving from an industrial age into an information age, that uh, similar to the average American farm boy's knowledge of tanks which supported our mechanization in World War II. Well, today, with arcade games and, and what have you, uh, there is an, an understanding, a familiarity with the use of computers that uh, is a relatively unique American advantage. Uh, the concept is that we will put you into a battle situation and create all of the battle stimuli such that you forget that you are in simulation and you literally then are linked by satellite with forces with whom you may join in combat. Okay, enemy situation. Currently there's a motorized rifle battalion operating within our sector. Enemy artillery is likely en route. You're not to become decisively engaged, but to fix and destroy the enemy and continue the mission. Okay, at this time, mount up, give me a radio check, and report Redcom 1. Here at Fort Knox, Kentucky, soldiers learn to fight in combat simulators that teach them how to think and react at lightning speed. Tank crews slide into soundproofed pods that duplicate the interiors of their M1A1 tanks and Bradley fighting vehicles. Then, linked by a computer network, they fight wars in virtual space. The 73 Easting simulation is one of many programs running on the Army SimNet, short for Simulation Network. SimNet is the current high end of computer simulation technology. It allows the soldiers sitting in these pods to fight in terrain that has been mapped by intelligent satellites and transformed into a digital battlefield that can be fought on over and over again. 
This saves money on gasoline and ammunition. It also lets soldiers fight in places they can't go in person. Missions are planned and fought in conditions as close to reality as possible. Black 6, Roger, you need to Charlie Mike through that zone where Red's out on the road. Locate the two BMDs, destroy them, and continue mission over. The blue, or friendly, forces of Simnet are all fighting this man, the central controller, an officer who is not chained to the vision ports of a single tank or airplane in virtual space. Today, he has programmed the movements of an artificial enemy division that will test the battle savvy of the tankers at Fort Knox. Though it might seem an elaborate computer game, Simnet exercises are taken very seriously by the soldiers locked in these pods. Here, they learn how to work as a unit, moving in coordination with dozens and sometimes thousands of other soldiers. And they can walk away from mistakes that would leave them dead on a real battlefield. Well, those are combat simulators. I mean, people go in there, and when they're hit, their vision blocks go blank, which I always thought was rather creepy. I mean, the, there's not like an eruption of big chunks of molten metal through the crew chamber, which is what would happen if you were actually hit, but everything simply stops. And then you and your crestfallen colleagues have to climb out and wander off into the uh, debriefing area, and you can watch the survivors carrying on the fight. The thing that struck me about it was that they immediately began discussing their experience, and they were not talking about it in terms of high technology. I did not hear the word virtual. I did not hear the term cyberspace. What I heard was advances, retreats, zones of fire. You actually killed, you actually killed 36. You lost eight because it took you a bit too long. Gentlemen, that's excellent. On your second run this evening, that is good. By the time this evening's over, you should have a few qualified runs. It was giving them an experience that was like a combat experience. I mean, and when this unit actually goes into combat, I would believe that they would know who is the natural leader among them, who is it who's level-headed, who has a good grasp of what's going on. You know, they would, uh, they would be more likely, they're, they're more aware of one another's strengths and weaknesses, and I think much better equipped to fight as a team. Pulling the United States Army out of the field and putting it into simulators has not been easy. Military traditions date back thousands of years, and at the core of those traditions is the willingness to go out into the field and fight in the dust, sand, mud, or snow. Also, soldiers need to believe in their prowess as rough and ready warriors. Gulf War proved that hand-to-hand -hand combat is practically a thing of the past for American soldiers. But GIs would like to think otherwise. Today, uh, nobody questions whether the internal combustion engine has a place on the battlefield. Uh, nobody questions whether the helicopter and the aircraft do. But there's a, there's a great uh, question in people's minds about the role of the microchip. The microchip is really the internal combustion engine of today. Uh, what role does technology and computerization uh, have in, in fighting vehicles? Uh, we're a generation which is much more comfortable uh, seeing our enemy through uh, clear sights and uh, being able to get our head out of the tank and uh, spot him through binoculars. Uh, there's, a, there's a great reluctance to trust the microchip and electronics into telling us those things and become uh, uh, wedded to, a, uh, to the output of a cathode ray tube or a thin screen display. War is still a matter of capturing land and overwhelming enemy armies, which is why air power alone cannot win a contest. But just as tanks changed the battlefield forever when they first appeared in World War I, so the computer has changed the way America goes to war. Like it or not, the speed of battle grows faster by the day. I mean, this is a society which has always adapted its cutting-edge technology to military ends. I mean, when we, had, when we were great at, at manufacturing cars and we overwhelmed Nazi Germany by manufacturing huge numbers of tanks and aircraft, now that we're into uh, high technology, circuit boards, television, media, multimedia, virtual reality, these are the tools that we're going to use in pursuit of American military preeminence. 
And these are the 1990s, and the time has come for Silicon Valley to have a few, you know, life-giving sips from the taxpayer's bloodstream here. And it's just a way for, you know, this particular element of our economy to just sort of segue right into the military and uh, bring the military up to digital snuff the way that, uh, you know, the computer revolution has affected every other major enterprise that, that America has. Fort Knox, Kentucky, a training room in the United States Army's Armor Center. Fire. Put away. Target. Target. Cease fire. Very good shot. Point two six. A young tank commander and his gunner are learning how to think and fight as a team. As the two key members of the tank crew, they are responsible for finding and killing enemies with maximum speed and effectiveness. Target. Target. Chopper. Identify. Fire. Get him away. He's going down. Bang. Oh. Shoot. Cease fire. Sergeant First Class Guy Kukowski, a veteran tank commander, evaluates the soldier's gunnery skills and, most importantly, what he calls crew cohesion. Roger. Get on him online. Pull it up or down, whatever you need to do. Track him even. Lays and blaze. You're waiting just a little too long to fire the gun, okay? Roger. Lays and blaze. Roger. I got a tank. Tank BC, tank first. As a tank commander, you have to know what that gunner's limitations fire. are, and, uh, what, his, what his capabilities are. Is he better firing uh, with his thermal night sight, uh, which you can use during the day also? Or is he better identifying targets with the uh, primary sight, the daylight? Uh, you don't want him to shoot at targets at 3,000 meters if you know he can't hit anything at 3,000 meters. You know, so the, that's probably the biggest thing right there is that tank commander gunner. They got to be tight. They got to know what. They've got to depend on each other, and they have to know each other pretty well uh, to be able to to be able to do what they do well. The challenge is that. There are some things that you simply cannot replicate in simulation. Uh, cold, wet, tired, miserable, trying to use your map and blowing away and, and losing your platoon or your company about you. Now, however, there are some things when literally for purposes of training, for example, in an intense battle where you need to put people into situations such as they're just bone tired and then you stress them. Uh, we've gotten fairly close to that out at the National Training Center uh, where uh, there's repetitive stress for a period of, of 14 days. The National Training Center is a barren tract of land deep in the California desert. Brigades from around the world come here to do battle against the Op 4, short for opposing force. The Op 4 is a highly skilled unit that lives at the NTC and knows every inch of its terrain. It fights using Soviet tactics and a simulated Soviet arsenal. This training obviously takes place in the real world, but here too high technology has made training safer and cheaper. All the weapons at the NTC are rigged to fire laser beams instead of bullets, although tanks fire dummy rounds for effect. When a tank is hit, a red light flashes and its crew joins the ranks of the living dead. The whole range of the equation changes once you're in combat. I think with it, that we can represent it uh, probably uh, perhaps 80 to so percent uh, in different types of situations that we can put you in for training. Uh, but uh, you will never be able to train uh, to that last bit of, of the ultimate, well, the unlimited liability, the responsibility for your subordinates to and including the, the point of death. Okay, so Bravo Company's main effort, and what we had to do was fix the enemy so Bravo Company could conduct their movement, correct? Right. That's what we were going to do. Roger? Okay. Now, Soldiers come to the NTC knowing it will be the hardest battle they will face outside of actual combat. Months of training precede NTC visits, and the stakes are high here for commanders and soldiers alike. 
we need to improve at our level as well as uh, two steps up. <clears throat> Defeating the Op Corps is else? a prize coveted by many, but it's a goal no, that's rarely achieved. The hardest task facing the modern army is getting soldiers and machines to strike in a massive but coordinated burst of power. A successful soldier is a soldier who follows standard operating procedure. He's exactly right. Once we get our SOPs down and once we get the time to practice and rehearsal, then we'll have no problem. Okay? in the Persian Gulf was the first test of the American military since microchips became a common part of weapons systems. Now targets could be sighted miles away and killed at previously unthinkable distances. For many, locating and killing real Iraqi soldiers was not much different than blasting away at simulated targets. Either way, the reality of the event is channeled through a video screen. Well, it's, it's true that war has become a phenomenon that America witnesses through screens, but I think our daily lives are fairly disconnected also. <laughs> if you look at people's leisure activities and so forth, I mean, you know, the, the idea of like you're going to drop everything after work and go out for a an Amish barn raising or something, I mean, that doesn't happen. I mean, people go to their cubicles and turn on cable TV, sort of like the program they're watching now, and this is like what passes for American real life now, and, you know, it's only, uh, it's only natural that we fight our wars in the same way. Before the Gulf War, no one was certain that simulators prepared soldiers for real combat. After the war, the astounding performance of the American Army was directly linked to its training. The simulation of the Battle of 73 Easting was created partly to prove that the army that lost the Vietnam War was dead. In its place, like a phoenix from ashes, stood the deadliest army on earth. In most things in life, particularly in the friction of, of actual war, you, you discount capabilities. In other words, if somebody says such and such has a hit-kill probability of 95%, uh, I kind of, I, I snicker because that's not with a gunner who's under fire, who's tired, who's wet, who's miserable, who's not really sure he wants to be there and his buddy may have been killed and he's not really very interested in all this and he's all out by himself. Well, under those circumstances, the, the hit or the hit probability can go from 95 to about 40 percent. Well, what we found with a very, very detailed analysis round by round in 73 Easting, as it was recreated by the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency in about 92, was that this organization basically did everything right. Their hit probabilities were, were in the range of, of 0 0.95, 96. Uh, if they saw it, they hit it. When they hit it, they killed it. In the Gulf War, computer literate soldiers used advanced technology to overwhelm a competent but technologically backward enemy. It's unlikely that future opponents will make the same mistake. The next war will be fought around the clock at speeds as fast as the latest CPU. Victory or failure will be determined by software. I think there's a possibility of a virtuality arms race coming up. I mean, obviously, if this particular technology really does aid U.S. strategic interests vastly to, to the point where our military can annihilate anyone else's, obviously the, the cutting edge of military innovation in other countries will be to attempt to mimic the United States. So even if the United States is not directly involved in a war, you can imagine two you know, relatively minor industrial powers or post-industrial powers having an actual virtual war and I think, should that, ha should that happen, it's likely to be unbelievably ugly. The two keys on future battlefields by the turn of the century are going to be, first of all, sensors. The ability of probably both sides to
to know where all of the vehicles and, and all of the units of the other side are at great distances uh, down probably to the individual vehicle level. I think that uh, you'll also find that there's a capability for, for both sides to, uh, to destroy at great range with precision weapons. Uh, so we're going to see much greater distances, we're going to see great speed, and we're probably going to see a battlefield in which uh, the speed of the, of the vehicles and the weapons is, is going to have to be uh, matched with the speed of the ability of the leaders to think. Eventually, as they come to rely more and more upon computerized means of perception and computerized means of decision, decisions and perceptions will be made in nanoseconds, not the, you know, the minutes or hours that a human being needs. And human beings, in fact, may be, you know, snug in the central command center somewhere near Orlando, Florida, uh, remotely piloting autonomous machinery, which is going out and predating upon human beings. And uh, that being the case, I would think that uh, eventually, you know, with, with the trends that, that are going now, a conventional battlefield would essentially be as uninhabitable as the site of a nuclear explosion. The mere fact that we can now turn the planet into a smoking nuclear crisp doesn't mean that, uh, that he, all human conflict is over. People still die, they still kill, they still die for, for, for a cause, they still struggle for their nation, their country, their family, their wives, their children, their husbands. Um, it's just that we don't choose to do something which is immediately and utterly suicidal. And I would think that a, a true, a truly cyberneticized battlefield would be essentially suicidal. I mean, it would just be, it would be a, a site of a, of a pogrom. It would not be warfare, it would be massacre uh, for both sides. In the virtual world, digital images are representations of reality, proxies for flesh and blood. Victory and defeat, pain and death are transitory. The press of the button brings everyone back to life. The difference between a real war and a virtual war is the difference between a matrix of dots and a gallon of blood.
you go. Good. Follow the tracks. We'll go out here and we'll see if we can hit some of that desert up there. All right. Once we get up here to this road, I want you to go ahead and uh, take the road to the left. And once you get up to speed, we'll go ahead and shift into high gear again. Okay. You got a long straightaway coming with a lot of hills. I want you to keep it uh, floored. That way we should not have to go into low gear again. 